Hello, I'm Charles Gaydon, Senior Provider Education Consultant at Palmetto GBA. Today, we are going to give you the nuts and bolts on submitting the pre-claim review request for home health. You have already seen the video on the background of the pre-claim review, why we have it, and the basics of the claims processing side. Today, we're gonna to give you the inside track on making sure you have the right documentation to tell your story. So we are going to walk through exactly how to put this together. Now there are various ways to do it. You can do it electronically, fax, mail. That's not going to matter. As long as you have all the pieces in there, as long as you get it to us and you give us the right information, you will have an affirmed claim. We have to have the right beneficiary information. That kind of sounds like a given, but make sure we have the right beneficiary information. The beneficiary name and the HIC number. There are a lot of John Smiths out there in Medicare, so just putting John Smith's name on there without his date of birth or the Medicare number, we're not going to know which patient that is. We have to have the certifying physician's information. So that will be his name, his NPI. Now his PTAN is optional, but the NPI is mandatory, and we have to have the practice address. We also need your home health information, so we do need your agency's name, we have to have your NPI, and we do need your PTAN, your provider number. The reason is, only certain states are allowed to bill these pre-claim review requests. So your PTAN, that six digit number that goes on your claim, those first two digits tell what state you're in. So if you're from a state that's not part of the pre-claim review process, it will not go through. So your PTAN is very important as well as your agency address. It's very important to have a contact name and a telephone number in the event that there is a processing issue, something does not go as planned, we need to know who to contact to resolve something. So please put a specific person's phone number. The operator is not very helpful because we don't know who to ask for if that's the only number you give us. So a specific name and a specific phone number that goes to a specific person is what we need. Other information that must be part of the process or the claim will not go through has to reference the episode, the dates. So the beginning and end or the through and from dates as most people refer that have to be in there. The submission date, meaning the date that you submitted the request needs to be there. And we also need to know if this is an initial or a resubmission. A resubmission means you submitted it one time, it was out of some pieces missing or some element that did not pass first review and you're resubmitting it. And once again, you have to have the state. Now again, just a quick review of the Medicare requirements because what you're doing with this pre-claim review is you are showing the reviewers at Paul Meadow GBA that this patient meets the home health guidelines. So the person has to be homebound or confined to the home. And we're gonna talk about ways to make sure your documentation tells that story. Remember, and you see that bullet that says due to illness or injury, your documentation has to explain something different from this person's baseline. You don't want to present a chronically ill person that's just getting older and just slowing down because they're just getting older. Has to be a medical reason why this person needs home health services. You have to demonstrate they're under the care of a physician. So we're gonna talk about the plan of care requirements that are part of this submission and the need for skilled services. You have to justify the need for PT, speech language pathology, OT, what have you. Now, just remember, a simple order, physician ordering physical therapy, is not justification by itself. You have to provide documentation on the person's needs, and we'll tell you how to do all of that in a few minutes. You also have to make sure you submit the face-to-face -face information. We have a separate video that goes deep into the face-to-face -face information. It was targeted to the certifying physicians, but it's also excellent for the home health agencies to look at also. So I recommend your staff watches that. 
You have to make sure the time frame, 90 days before start of care or 30 days after. Make sure your encounter is in that window and make sure the date is clear so we can tell it's in that window and it has to be related to why the person needs those services. You have to put the HICPIC codes for your disciplines on the claim. So your nursing services, your physical therapist, your OT, your aides, your physical therapy assistant, social worker, all of those go on there. And remember, when you put these codes on there, your documentation has to support a need for these services. If you put the need for speech language pathology on there by putting that HICPIC code on there, but none of your documentation supports why you need a speech language pathologist, that's not going to be affirmed and you are going to have to resubmit. And those are the rest of the codes. This slide here is a critical pathway. Now, if you are using the electric portal, it is on there. It is also on our website under the uh, tools for the PCR checklist and the links will be at the very end of the presentation. This walks you through your logic on how to put your documentation together. Like I said, it's on the e-services portal, but whether you mail it, fax it, use Pony Express or walk with it, the documentation requirement is going to be exactly the same. And this gives you a perfect roadmap to make sure you have all the pieces. We also have two checklists that are on our website and we're going to walk through this as we talk through this session on a subsequent and initial submission. The documentation for start of care is slightly different from a later episode, so we will highlight those. But these documents are great checklists to make sure you have everything, so you wanna just put a check mark, make sure that your staff has put the right pieces in there, and you don't have to go through the resubmission process. The documentation will go under task. Again, regardless of what methodology you use, these same tasks will be there. The first task is the face-to-face -face encounter documentation. So this is the document that originates from the physician. So either the outpatient visit note, generally speaking an evaluation and management note, or something that came from the facility, either the discharge summary from the hospital or a progress note from the hospital, nursing facility, or where they happen to come from. Now, remember that this document is supposed to support eligibility and need for services. So you're looking at something written in a problem-oriented format. It has a history of the problem, exam or physical assessment findings, and some type of plan that relates to this person needs nursing, they need physical therapy, they need something that the home health agency can provide. So remember this task has to be there. You cannot skip this one. Even if you're talking about a later episode, you must put the face-to-face -face documentation in there, regardless of the episode. Now task two is information generated by the home health agency to support what's in task one. The home health agency has a lot of good information that they naturally obtain. Your comprehensive assessment has great pieces of documentation that looks at how the person can groom themselves, feed themselves, bathe themselves, ambulate, fall risk. All of these things are natural pieces of your documentation. If the face-to-face -face information in task one does not quite cover all of the needs, you can submit your documentation to the physician have him sign off on that and include that in task two. Your comprehensive assessment, other things could be your physical therapy assessment. That's gonna contain natural things like the person's ability to ambulate, uh, strength, issues with balance, coordination. All these things are gonna to point to a person needing skilled services, person being homebound. So you can submit these, have the physician sign off on them, and put them in task two. Now, a question is always asked, does the physician always have to sign the comprehensive assessment? Do they always have to sign the therapy evaluations? 
If you want them counted as part of the face-to-face -face documentation, yes, they need to be co-signed. If you fill the information in task one, supports itself and you don't need any additional documentation to support the face-to-face, -face, these do not have to be signed. But my recommendation, you're already getting all that good information anyway, because it's a requirement that you have to do. Why not go ahead and have the physician sign it and just put more evidence? Now, if you're using a face-to-face -face form still, that is fine, but the face-to-face -face form goes under this task, not under task one, because that is not something that originates from the physician. So your face-to-face -face form, if you're still using it, goes under this task. Task three, the plan of care. The plan of care, a lot of people are still using the good old CMS 485 or some facsimile of it. You need to put that under task three. That's the plan of care for the current episode in the event this is a later episode and the start of care plan of care. You have to have both of them. So if you leave out one or the other, you're gonna run into a non-affirmation. It has to be signed. So make sure you have a signed version and make sure you have a legible version. A lot of times these get faxed back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to the doctor's office and after that fourth fax, everything gets blurry. So make sure you have a legible copy that the words can be read, the signature can be seen, and the date. Be careful of bottom margins when you're faxing and scanning. Your typical 485, the signature is at the very bottom of the page. A lot of times that gets cut off when somebody is faxing and scanning. So make sure you get the entire document. Now tax four is a certification. Now if you're using a traditional 485, most of the time that is gonna be on the plan of care itself. In the event you have it written somewhere else, you would put it under this task. You also need to include the recertification statement when you are talking about a later episode. So you have to have that statement from the physician that this patient will need skilled services for X amount of more days or X amount of weeks. Remember, you have to have a quantifiable time. So the question I know somebody has, I have a Foley patient or a diabetic that is going to be here forever. What do I do about that person? You still have to go through this process. You can put a time longer than 60 days if you want to, but you have to do this every 60 days regardless of what time you put in there. You have to put a time that's quantifiable. So until discharge, until death do us part, or some phrase like that is not acceptable. You have to have a time frame that you can look on the calendar and figure out exactly what you're talking about. And if you have a long-term person, again, pick a date and reassess at that time. Task five is going to be the most interesting task because there's so many things you can do with this one. Task five is when you're supporting the person being homebound and you're supporting medical necessity. So for homebound documentation, the words on the screen are referencing information from the manual. But you want to make sure your documentation includes this. Now your comprehensive assessment should have a lot of this information in it. So if you did not include this under task two, you can include it here and this be a perfect place to do it. Your comprehensive assessment naturally talks about ambulation, if they have crutches, if they have a cane, all those things. Your therapy assessment. If the person has therapy ordered, you need to submit that. So put that here with task five and also your evaluation and assessments both go here. So if the person has been on service a couple of episodes, you need the current assessment plus the previous one. So make sure you put all your therapy information here. You also have to show that there's a medical reason the person cannot leave home. Like I said earlier, you don't want to paint the picture that this is just a little old person that's just winding down and can't leave the house because they're just getting old. So there are three little checklists that can help you do this. Structural impairment is a checklist one, functional impairment is two, and activity limitation is three. Here is checklist one. It references structural impairment. So basically, 
your visual inspection of your documentation. If this person has some type of visual anomaly, and that's what a structural impairment is, is an anatomical change, that's where you want to put this. Now, most of your patients may not have a structural impairment. Wound care would be an exception, or if they had a broken bone, or they had an injury from a fall, there you might see a structural change. But do not be concerned if you cannot find a structural impairment. Your person may not have one. Checklist two and three, your person should definitely have. Now checklist two is the physiological or functional part. So basically your physical assessments should identify a functional impairment. You're treating the person for a medical problem. So it should line up with one of the items on this checklist. If your person has out of control high blood pressure, you would check functions of the cardiovascular system and put in there your blood pressure record that shows the person's blood pressure is very high, very low, or fluctuations to and fro. If the person has diabetes, you see functions of the metabolic and endocrine systems. What are their blood sugars? Hyperglycemia versus hypoglycemia, fainting, dizziness, or the side effects of that would be your documentation. So whatever the reason you're admitting them, what symptoms go with that diagnosis naturally, you check that box and make sure you put that information there. Your activity limitations. You're looking at therapy. Therapy has to be working on something. What are they working on? If physical therapy is working on that person's ambulation and transferring, you would check mobility. If occupational therapy is helping them dress themselves, you have self-care. Um, you also can have speech language pathology helping with communication or domestic life helping them with feeding themselves. Whatever your therapist is signed up to do, there is something on this list you can match it to. So your therapy assessments, therapy evaluation, if you want to stick in some of your therapy individual visit notes, that will be helpful. You also want to make sure your therapy goals are in this section. What your therapist is working on. Measurable goals. The person will walk from the bedroom to the bathroom, which is 30 feet, in six weeks. You have to have something that is quantifiable. You don't want to have a six million dollar man goal. The person will get better, stronger, faster. That's not going to cut it. You have to have something that is measurable and has the action started, the action finished. I can clearly delineate those. For homebound, don't take for granted that you write down that somebody had a fall that makes them homebound. Make sure you are giving the symptoms. The person has a cane, they have crutches. If the person is new to this device, you wanna make sure that that's brought out. A person with a walker for one week versus a walker for six years that tells a different story. Medical symptoms that make the person homebound. Shortness of breath. Very powerful thing in documentation. How far can that person walk due to shortness of breath? The person cannot bear weight. They have a gaping wound on their leg so they can't put weight on that leg. Those are powerful examples of things to talk about. Safety issues. If your person has a psychiatric issue or if some type of dementia is the reason they're homebound, make sure that's clearly documented. Sometimes the providers don't do that and the functional part shows they can walk fine, so we don't know why that person is homebound. Pain is something you wanna make sure you're documenting. Don't just say pain, yes or no. This patient's pain is normally a two, now it's a nine. You wanna make sure that you are showing something is different. So these four questions, if you've been in Paul Middle GPA sessions over the years, this should look familiar to you. If you can answer these four questions in your documentation, you should have told that person's story for skilled services and for homebound. Structural impairments, functional impairments, activity limitations, and what's a nurse or therapist gonna do about it? That fourth bullet is probably the most important because that defines why the person is in home health. Nursing and therapy are going to be what gets you paid. So you have to justify why they are there. 
And those are just definitions on the screen about structures and functions. I've already discussed that. And activity limitations. Look at those ADLs they should do every day. Feeding themselves, bathing themselves, brushing their teeth, combing their hair. They can't do that because their illness, how's the therapist, how's the nurse gonna help them over that hump? So remember, your chronically ill person has to have an acute problem, an acute symptom. That's what the home health agency is doing. The person is gonna have high blood pressure the rest of their life. So you're not going to make that part go away. You're getting them stable. That's what you're doing. Stabilizing a exacerbation of a chronic condition. Now to help yourself out with medical necessity, you want to make sure you're choosing the appropriate diagnosis. You want to avoid what they call integral part codes. And I know my coders out there know what I'm talking about. You have to make sure that you are coding the diagnosis not a symptom. For example, my person has, let's see, what's a good example? My person has gastroenteritis. And you know what that is, you have a stomach bug. A natural symptom of that is nausea. Another natural symptom is vomiting. You do not want to say I'm admitting this person because they have nausea and vomiting when you know they have gastroenteritis. Those are natural symptoms of that disease. So the gastroenteritis, would be your admission. That's just an example. Other things you want to make sure you're documenting, looking at that body system, deviations from normal. So again, you're looking at my cardiac system. What's different? I can't walk as far as I used to could walk. I can't transfer like I used to. I used to could sit up, now they're stuck in the bed. What is different? They have some type of condition where they wear their self out. That's what you want to do. Think of that before and after. Before I had this exacerbation, I could do this. Since I've had it, this is what my limitation is. Respiratory, same type thing, shortness of breath at rest, inability to talk, I can't yell at the TV during the football game. Something is different. Talking is something that people just overrate, but if you're on the phone and you used to talk for five minutes, now you can only talk for one minute before you run out of breath, that's a significant finding. So don't overlook something like that. Musculoskeletal changes. This really is going to help your homebound. How far can the person walk? What do they need to get from point A to point B? They need crutches. They need a ramp now. They lean against the wall. They can't bear weight. What's different from them trying to get from point A to point B? I referenced your diabetic patient already. What symptoms make them need home health? Their blood sugar is high, it's low, they're having confusion, they're having those signs and symptoms. What is different? If you're admitting them because they not, cannot give their own insulin, make sure that is documented why. The person cannot use their hands for whatever reason. They can't see because they have diabetic retinopathy. Whatever your rationale is, make sure that's clearly documented and make sure your activities are just there so we know why you have those therapists there. Based on that physical symptom, it should tie to an inability to do something to take care of myself. So going back to those four questions, if you can answer all four of those questions, you should be in very good shape. Now here are a few extra special golden nuggets to help put you over the top. Looking at your nursing services, those G codes that we referenced earlier, Observation and assessment. That is when we have a patient that needs some observation to make sure that they're going to be okay getting back to their normal life. Either we're monitoring their medications because we had to change them, they just had a heart attack, so we're making sure they're not overdoing it. Whatever reasons you're observing, make sure that is clearly documented. What are you looking for to prevent? What are you hoping doesn't happen? So you have to say, this is what I'm observing for. And roughly every three weeks, you have to have a summary. Is this person looking like they're doing better or they're still at risk for exacerbation? I need to continue to observe them. So some vague statements people have been writing for years, monitoring disease process, that does not tell anything by itself. 
The good old medication management. I know people love that one. What are you managing specifically? Are there new medications? Did somebody change the dose? Are you looking for side effects, adverse reactions? What does medication management mean as far as the home health benefit? Teaching and training. This is another one of those goodies that people use and don't explain what they're doing. Teaching and training means there's a specific task you are trying to teach that beneficiary. Teaching them to give their own insulin. Working with an Alzheimer's person to dress themselves, to brush their teeth, or do some type of simple function. So once again, have a specific task what you're trying to do. You should have something lifted that once again has a beginning and an end. So we know when that person has completed that task. You have to have a reasonable amount of time. If you're trying to teach somebody to do a wound and after a certain amount of time, they're just not getting it, you need to adjust your plan and come up with a plan B. So you wanna document those efforts, why this didn't work and what we're going to do next. Your therapy documentation. We have had issues with people forgetting these documents. So I wanna reiterate this. You have to include your therapy evaluation, current therapy, 30 day assessment, and the previous one if the time factor is appropriate. You have to include your goals. If those things are not included, your claim will not be affirmed. You have to have a good baseline for therapy. And these are your basic ADLs there on the screen, eating, bathing, dressing. You have to know what that person's baseline is so you can document if they're improving. You can't say someone walked better when you didn't document what they were walking like in the first place. Make sure you have a baseline on these actions on the screen. Objective tests and measures. There are several listed in the Medicare Manual 100-2, Chapter 15. If you look at the American Physical Therapy Association's home health section, it gives you many objective measures. I put some common ones on the slide that many of you use. The point I want to bring out is you have to be specific when you're using these tools. These are used to identify somebody's risk for falling. They don't all have the same exact scale. A five on a Tenetti does not equal a five on a Mach 10. So just to simply say, my patient is a fall risk five and no other information, that doesn't tell anything. Explain what tool you used and what that score means. Definitely include that. If you have the form, include that. But definitely put the score and what tool you definitely used. This is a tool that is on the Paul Middle GBA website. We originally put it together for regular ADRs, but it's an excellent tool for pre-claim review. It makes sure you include this. Did I add that? Did I get this page signed? So there is the hyperlink that will help your staff for training and also making sure you have the right pieces in there. Our pre-claim review section has a lot of resources. It has job aids. It has these videos will be listed under there. Several sources. So there's the web link on the screen. Please take advantage of those. Here's the user guide I referenced earlier. It has the checklist. It has that wire diagram. So this is a must. You want to check this periodically because as we get updates to the process, we will update this manual. This will be your holy grail basically for submitting your claims. So these are some other references we have. We will continuously put updates. As soon as we get information that will be helpful to you, we will definitely put that on the website so you can know the up-to-date changes. And here are our other changes that we will list in frequently asked questions or our fact sheets we will update that as time goes along. So we want to make sure that you have all the tools you need to get your pre-claim requests affirmed. Don't give up. If it's not affirmed the first time, you can resubmit it over and over and over and over till you get it right. The good thing about this is you have a chance to get something else. If you didn't get enough information from the physician, you can go back and get some more. As long as you do these things before the final claim is billed, you are able to go back and get that fixed. 
We want to see everybody get all their claims paid. We want people to get paid for the services they provide, and we want the beneficiary to receive the proper services. So that's our mission at Paul Mendo GBA. So we are going to continue to produce new tools. So please watch the website, watch the listserv. So whatever we find out that's gonna help you, we're gonna put it out there so you can be successful. I'm Charles Cannon from Paul Mendo GBA. Thanks for watching.